Hi, Annelie. It's so nice to have you on. I've heard so many great things about you. I've heard your recent episode on Amber's podcast as well. And I can relate to so many things that you covered there. But I think I would love to start this conversation by diving into what brought you to the world of coaching and the work that you do now. I love hearing people's stories because there is always something so special about it. Sure. Thank you, firstly, so much for having me on. Um, so what brought me to the world of coaching was an absolutely epic burnout that I had uh, just before my 30th birthday, and I'm 42 now. Uh, and a really good friend of mine was starting coaching. And in the UK at the time, it was very weird. It was a bit woo. It wasn't like Wendy Rhodes and Billions. It was like, what is this like sort of hippie stuff? Anyway, I had um, a session with her and she did a guided visualization and she owns a company called Electric Woman. And in this visualization, you get to meet your most electric self, you know, your kind of best, best version of yourself, most energetic. And my version of me was not doing the corporate job that I was doing and she was not suffering in all the ways that I was suffering and she was not miserable. And that just really connected to me in a way that other things hadn't so I'd done training courses you know I'd, I'd done an MBA I'd, I was very well educated and I was successful in my role um, but I'd never had an experience like that like maybe a little bit of like shavasana you know yoga or something like that I'd had like a bit of connection to I hadn't really found my spiritual path then either and this just took me to a whole new place and it it just gave me this energy I think is the best way to describe it and hope because I think when you you mentioned as well we had a chat off air when you've been through burnout you can you can kind of lose a bit of hope like how am I ever going to get out of this how am I ever going to feel better how am I going to cope with my life like I can maybe just about get my job done but I can't cope with my relationship or or whatever else or my health or you know you're band-aiding 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 and this just connected to me so inherently and so authentically that I was like cool there is this is something that I'd like to follow and uh, I am a type A so uh, whenever anything, if I want to uncover something, I kind of like to go into it and really experience it and learn it for myself. So after that session, I went freelance in my work rather than uh, working full time to give me some more time to travel, started creating the life that I want uh, and went over to the States to do all of my training in, in all of the coaching modalities. Um, and that was how the coaching business started, which is now about 14 years old, I think. And then on the back of that, a couple of years ago, just before lockdown, I got more involved in the trauma side of my work, which is a missing piece of my own healing that coaching couldn't quite get to. And after me having that revelation and kind of connection and taking that into my clients now, that's sort of where most of my day job goes, if you like. And it's been a revelation. So that's my story. Do you think that when people find themselves in those moments when they don't like their life, they don't like their job, are you the person who would say like, well, it's better to quit everything right this second, devote all your time into like finding the next right thing? Or, you know, like take your time. If you don't like your career, like have a side hustle first. What do you think is the right way? I think um, I think it really does depend on the individual. But I want to give a, a more helpful answer than that. And the thing that popped into my head was, you know, in Devil Wears Prada, when Anne Hathaway has to go back to her parents and like just you know kind of decompress for sort of two months because she was so broken. I mean, I think we we talk about work life balance. We talk about burnout, generally speaking, in the context of work. But I don't believe anymore we have work life balance. We we have to look at our whole life and sit and look at maintaining balance across our whole life and that is a system of consistent recalibrations so you know generally speaking if you're really struggling with work are your other foundations okay like is is relationship whether that's friendships family romantic are they are they okay are they supportive like can they be a bit of a container for you right now um physical health uh maybe a faith outside of that so if all if the answer to all of that is no, you're in a really, really, really dark place and work is making you really unwell and putting you at risk, then absolutely there probably needs to be a, a, a stronger intervention. But if there's maybe some of the other foundations that could either be shored up further, um, like me, I, I kept my 
at working in the industry that I was in that was making me burnt out and unwell. But I changed the first step was simply changing to be a freelancer with the same company rather than full time, which gave me more options of flexibilities before flexible working. And then I undertook the education. Then I did loads of what I call frog kissing. So kiss loads of frogs, you know, did loads of testimonials, had loads of experience. And at the point I got to a tipping point, the inversion point of when I could let go of my previous identity, if you like, the previous work and maintain a business of coaching. So I think you can hear these stories. And I think there's an awful lot of pressure on people to know your purpose, go after your purpose, don't rest unless you're, you know, living your purpose and do all these things and have a six figure side hustle in your purpose. And it's like, oh, my God, uh, well, you know, I'm just about getting through the day. So uh, I would say if there is obviously real concern, then the need, you know, the, the higher the concern or the higher the pain, the greater the intervention that would be needed. But for most of us, I think we can look at nudging the needle you know, a couple of degrees, and then over time, reaping the benefits of that. Speaking about finding your purpose, you're right, like everyone is like, just go for it, find your purpose. But okay, like I let's say I've been doing one job for 20 years, I don't like it. I don't even know what my purpose is, because I have this past stories, all those self imposed limiting beliefs, or maybe that, you know, some constraints that were assigned to me by society I have no idea like which way to go to find that purpose forget about courage it takes to actually you know take a leap of faith so if you're one of those people who have no idea which direction to go what is the first step of course and you know you make it's a really helpful point because I do think there is this just huge pressure and you're right like if you know where you're jumping off into you'll jump like it doesn't take courage when you've got something exciting to go after it takes courage when you're you're in bits and you don't know what to do like a terrible heartbreak you know that takes courage to take steps forward when there's not the life or the dream that you you'd built into and you're going to start walking down a path that you have no idea where that leads but you know you've got to keep putting one foot in front of the other like that's courage You know, you're literally training yourself to get used to the unknown. What I would say about helping someone to find purpose is, and I've been exploring this a lot more myself, and when I've been through really difficult periods, and maybe I have had to look at sort of life-changing direction and feeling maybe out of control or, or, you know, not fulfilled, is self-reflection. Now, that could be in the form of sort of free-flowing journaling or something like that, but self-reflection is a much deeper inquiry. It's like, right, okay, I'm unhappy in my job. Well, what part of me, you know, we're looking at the whole life balance. Is it because I'm my relationship suffering? Is it because I'm not socializing as much? Is it because I don't feel valued at work? You know, let's let's keep going down this inquiry chain to find out what's really living underneath that. And then another thing that you can do is to look at things that do make you feel alive. So we can call it the flow state. What are you doing when you you know, lose track of time. And is that something you would like? Would you still enjoy that thing? Here's the other thing. Oh, well, I love doing Pilates, right? Okay, well, I'm going to become a Pilates instructor. Well, no, no, that's not the same. Because the reason I lose myself in an exercise class is because somebody's telling me what to do. And I'm not thinking and I'm enjoying the movement. And I'm not doing it all day and getting up at whatever time to go and teach a a 6am class across town. So it's, it's really important to get into kind of how you would like to shape your day. And one of the things that I did that might be helpful, because I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly. I just knew that I had to stop where I was because I was really unwell. Uh, One thing that I did was I wrote a list of what I will not do anymore. So rather than the business plan, I wrote things. This is like, I'd say a long time ago, but I realized that one of the biggest negative impacts on my week was Sunday night dread which most people can like, especially before flexi working, right? So it was in the office, 8am, central London, getting the underground, all the stuff, you know, January, like just so miserable. And I was like, right, okay, well, I'm going to have the kind of job or business or clients that I never, ever take the underground before midday on a Monday. So what that did was it meant that I didn't have Sunday night dread. It kind of informed that I you know, I started like working from home or having a local client on a Monday or calls. I would then back my meetings in, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday or travel on those dates. So it sounds a little bit facetious, but by writing in the things, like I say, like a values inquiry, what is it that's making me really, really unhappy? Even if I don't know what would make me happy, let's try and eradicate some of these things that are costing me my peace. And I know that. And then when I free myself up from there, again, nudge the needle, 
what can I do when I'm I'm like rediscovering things about myself? I've got this energy back. I'm not spending, you know, at least half of my blessed two days of the weekend feeling awful and depressed. You know, what can I do with that energy? And it, it tr- changed the game for me. I've heard so many people saying that if you look back at when you were, I don't know, like four, seven years old, as a child, you had an idea what you might like in life. At least like, you know, activities that brought you joy. And again, like everyone is saying, especially on social media, like go back to your childhood. All the clues are there. Do you agree with this? I mean, I don't even know if I can remember like that age particularly clearly. And I mean, my childhood wasn't particularly safe or happy. I grew up in a household of violence. I think the only thing I wanted was to be, I wanted to be like Matilda and Roald Dahl. I wanted to have a, a, a happy home and feel safe. So, you know, I've ended up as a trauma therapist and doing coaching, like Freud would have a field day with that probably. But no, I mean, I think I probably wanted to be a pirate as I remember, you know, so uh, like, I, I think, I think again, if you're really lost and really struggling, that finding the inner, reconnecting to your inner child and finding joy, excellent. But maybe when you're in that joyful space, uh, you know, again, doing this self inquiry from there, doing the self reflection from there would be would be a good thing to do. I mean, it's not a. I think for, am I allowed to swear on this? It's, it's my evening in the UK, so there's Please. a there's a saying which is that you, you okay? Thank you. So you know, you've got to make sure that you're wearing your rose tinted spectacles, not your shit tinted spectacles. And because otherwise you're going to try, you know, imagine trying to do your business plan or plan your life or find your purpose when you're exhausted, burnt out, depleted, feeling like crap. Like it's, oh, what did I like doing when I was four? I can't remember. Oh my life. You know, I haven't got that now. I'm failing at everything. Like these social media standards, says she is an influencer, but that they're really, not very not always very helpful they can be a good like guideline maybe and like i say connect to the joy of your inner child if that's easy for you to access and if it's not don't worry like that's that's also completely okay maybe think about how you expressed yourself were you more of a visual person did you prefer listening to things were you always very active and but i think i think that's just like kind of being a bit sensible what what do you need to do we're grown ups now that get me into the best possible position to make a choice so where am I the most likely to have my rose tinted specs or not the shit tinted ones like not Sunday night dread you know maybe after I've interacted with a friend that I love or um had some great food or done like the the exercise class that makes me feel great go to the cafe after that and sit there then and do it then don't don't do it from the, the the place of pain would be my advice I can relate so much to this because I also don't remember too much about my childhood. And I started asking my mom, like, what did I like? And she would tell me things, but then I realized, well, it's her perception. It's her story. And then as we especially work on ourselves and become more self-aware, we grow, we evolve, our priorities, choices may change because we also enter different environments. So I feel like it's you constantly rediscovering who you are. Absolutely. And I love that you made that. And actually, interestingly, and if it's helpful, children don't see themselves as emotionally separate from their caregivers until they're about seven. So I always give the example that my daughter is seven. So she's kind of gaining emotional autonomy. So if say if I'm really upset, she can hold a different emotional state. She might worry about me, but she she won't take on the same emotion. Whereas a couple of years ago, if I was getting really upset, she'd start panicking and worrying and maybe crying as well and getting quite upset because mummy's upset. It's because they, you know, it's, it's, it's safety in this sense of like emotional autonomy. So yeah, again, it probably is going to maybe be your parents' story and perception, but also it, it would have been because we're kind of mirrors of them at that stage, you know, because we're in this, in this environment, which of course changes. And even just, you know, practically time moving on different opportunities. When I, when I was working, when I had my burnout 12 years ago, there was no flexi working, you know, there was none, like it didn't exist. And then obviously we've completely transformed what is even possible now. So you can work at organizations and still go to an office, but still have more of a family balance, the whole life balance again, we can calibrate that in a different way. So I think, yeah, I think some of these, some of these like go and do this and you'll find your purpose maybe but if you don't please don't feel like a failure that's that would be my please don't feel like a failure if you don't because i i I don't think they they're universally applicable to everybody 
Speaking about when you transition into this new career for yourself as a trauma specialist and performance coach, you've mentioned visualization. What is it like? It's like that, you know, you had that experience like with that teacher. When you speak about visualization, is it more like meditation, like Joe Dispenza, for instance, does? Like close your eyes, envision who you want to become and then become that person or it was more like what's possible in general for yeah you. so when when i had that experience in particular um uh, my friend she she took me through a guided experience where i met sort of my future self but me as this electric woman as this 10 so that was really great and really informative i do something similar with clients where you meet a future version of yourself a different version but another thing that i do and that can be really helpful and i have found is unbelievably powerful is if you were to write down say somewhere that you might want to be in six months to a year you do it obviously in the positive in the affirmation sense I am I have you know so I am surrounded by friends at a table for my birthday in the south of France I have a fulfilling career um, with beautiful clients that I'm enriched by and rewarded by you know those sorts of things those kind of statements I will do that probably once a year once every six months for myself and I do it for clients as well and I record it into my phone like a meditation and the more and more and more that you listen to it because I'm, I'm very visual but also auditory is always the way I've learned uh, whenever I needed to revise I would I would read out things and listen to them listen to them listen to them and it's an incredible it acts as like an incredible compass and sort of source of direction so one the exercise again is quite self-reflection okay where might I like to be it's called future pace like where might I like to be in the future let's pick a date realistic where there's time for things to action and happen and then what are some things that I would like to be experiencing and then allowing without too much hold you know I'm quite spiritual so I'd say the universe but just allowing these things to present themselves to you and, and not being too directive you know I'd like to have a fulfilling romantic relationship not saying they must look like this or have this or have that you know just like allowing that kind of thing to step into your life so that is a really really powerful tool and a great way of um, actioning and helping you to action and if you like sort of reprogramming your system to help along with if we're talking about manifestation or something like that I have a vision board as well mm -hmm. I redo mine every year I've recently redone mine and in my witch aesthetic, which is, you know, so I've got that for next year. And then alongside that, I will do a recording and I will listen to it a couple of times a week. But there's a lot of, in wow, most this of the is so powerful. Work, sports performance. Yeah, we do it in sports performance a lot as well. You know, imagine yourself connecting to the ball. Imagine yourself watching the ball in flight. Imagine seeing it landing. So, yeah, it's a really great thing to do. It's completely free. I would recommend that everybody does it. Do you think that? you know, for those like visualizations, like vision boards, the only way to actually get there is to change your energy and to act as that person would in the present. Yes, there's a lady called Tara Swat, who I think is a neuroscientist, and she's brilliant and she calls them action boards not vision boards so she would design them in the same way but she's she says you know you've got to have the intention of these are the actions it's not just sort of uh i guess it's not as um loose but it's you know and then the more and more you're focusing on it and like that recording as well the more and more you're looking for the actions to take towards it if you like so uh if i've got on my vision board um I don't know, a certain car or something like that, then, and I'm listening to it and I'm thinking about that, then I'm going to be maybe looking, you know, what, okay, well, what, how much does this car cost? Or what do I need to do with my old car? Or where might I get this car from? Or um, how, what kind of clients do I need to take on to, for this to be possible for me? Or what sort of work? And it's, it's really about, again, a bit like we give the, the heartbreak example. And I think we've probably all been there in some way, shape or form, and just literally having to force one foot in front of the other until you can begin to feel like yourself again I think with manifestation it, it can feel a bit like that it can feel so far removed from you um but yet the tiny actions the tiny steps are taking you towards you know what you're what you're hoping to achieve but it's the the actions the the small tiny daily actions like habits like habit stacking what are the actions that you're taking towards that you know uh car or whatever it might be that you've got on that board 
So true. I just actually recently recorded an episode with Agnes Callard and she has a book on aspiration. And I asked her like some people that aspire to become someone, but they don't have that dedication. And she's like, well, many people think that aspiration is just like you sitting there thinking about something. If I'm aspired, you don't need to like look into my head, what I'm thinking about. You look at what I do. That's so valuable. And I'm I'm really glad that you and she raised it because like I get quite a lot of people say reaching out to me, including people that, you know, I know personally go, oh, look at how many followers you've got on Instagram or, or look at this or, the, you know, other other things that seem to be lucky, right, in inverted commas. And I work every night. I'm a, I'm a single parent, you know, I grind and I graft and I don't mind it. I've got a good work ethic and I like, I work most weekends, you know, you run your own business, I run my own business. There's never a time really that I'm not checking in on something. I have responsibilities of looking after people financially. Like you don't want to hear that answer. You want to say that I wrote a post and put 10 hashtags down and you're going to get it like that. It's the same with like, um, I don't know, I, I want the perfect body, but I don't want to put the time in. Or I want to, you know, the, the answer is, if you want to be beach body ready by the summer, it's like training broccoli, chicken and brown rice. But you don't want to hear that. You want me to say that, oh, I, I discovered this fantastic thing that did it for me in 10 minutes. And, and that's the reality of achieving goals. And sometimes it might take me two years, three years, maybe even four, what's on that vision board. But if you start with something that is literally kind of, wow, Imagine if I had that, like, I'll often write out checks, like we don't cash checks anymore here in the UK, but I'll often write those out and pin them up with dates on. And maybe it's gone by a year. But if I've got there after a year, wow, you know, that's just incredible. And there's another kind of performance hack, which is, you know, if you aim for 100% in something, and I know it's unrealistic, but let's just say, um, you know, I'm working up towards lifting a certain weight. So I'm, I'm really working towards that. And it feels quite unrealistic. Now, if I don't get to that by the end of the year, but I get to one, two kilos lighter, have I failed? In a sense? Yeah, I didn't make my goal. But I've still had this progression and still got so much further than I ever would have done if I wasn't aiming there. So you have to aim high, but take actions towards it. It's interesting that you mentioned like many people may look at you, well, you have so many followers, you're so successful and they think it's easy. It's luck, as you said. It's the same, like I have an episode with Jennifer Lammers. She's an anchor on Fox. She used to be a correspondent on Extra. And we would like email back and forth at three in the morning her time. And when I posted this episode, a few comments there like, oh, what this person knows, like she's just always pretty having her own show. She doesn't need to work hard. Excuse me. She wakes up at three in the morning every yeah. single day. Yeah. And then still has her life around that, I bet as well. Still, you know, performing all the other roles that are expected of her and is, you know, doing that as well. And it, let's be honest, that's a hard, you know, it's a hard thing to be doing. You're putting yourself physically through something really, really difficult. And it's quite antisocial in the hours and the lifestyle you'd have to lead. It's quite, you have to go kind of against society to do that. So yeah, like, I, I, Shonda Rhimes always says, don't call me lucky, you call me a badass. Like, and I just love that. Like, this is not, it's not luck. You know, there may be, I might be putting myself in positions to um, gain the, you know, opportunities that are coming my way. But believe me, for, for the one thing that comes in, there's been a hundred no's. When you, when you go to coaching school, one of the first things they teach you is actually very valuable, is they teach you to collect no's. And they say, like, you know, go out and just everyone you meet, the person you're sitting next to on the plane, like everyone, chats them about coaching and ask them if they'd like a session. And they said, try and collect a hundred no's. Because in, in one of those, you'll get a yes. And you feel so awkward at first. And you feel really uncomfortable, really embarrassed. You're like, oh, my God. But they're right. And you have really enriching conversations. And maybe none of those people become a client, but you're building network. You're building your confidence. You're building just the reality that everyone's a bit awkward and kind of, you know, we're just all human, like despite our humanness, as Michael Singer says. So, yeah, like collect the nose. I would imagine when you know, you started your own journey on self-discovery, healing, and the work that you do with your clients now, because you 
change who you are, your surroundings, people around you change. Some of them stay with you. Others, they start drifting away. And quite often, it's not as pleasant. So how to create these new boundaries in a healthy way? Do you know that is really, really hard and I mean it's more I actually think putting the boundaries in place is kind of fairly easy because to be completely honest and this has happened to me personally so I'm giving you sort of personal and then I'd probably love to hear from you because I think unfortunately it's very universal but I have been incredibly hurt and disappointed by people that I had maybe wrongly but I'd assumed perhaps from history longevity maybe you know things that I'd poured into our relationship dynamic that was simply not there for me and have have maybe not been, um, you know, at times when I've been very vulnerable and shown up and said, I'm not, this isn't great, I'm really struggling. And you might get sort of some platitudes, but then there's no, there's no action, there's no follow through, so to speak. And it's been quite hard to find a home for some of that in, you know, going through my divorce a few years ago, things like that. It's what, that's kind of what I'm referring to. And, um, I think when you come through that and you can a bit like a, it's a heartbreak in a sense, it's grief in a sense, grieving friendships or connections or, you know, maybe people that you used to work with. If you're, if you're shifting all of these sorts of things, people that don't believe in your ideas, people that don't cheer for you. I've got that post cheer for me or steer clear of me. And that's really where I've got to now. It's like, if you can't cheer for me, you know, especially when you know me personally and you know, kind of, um, you know, things I'm doing and facing. And like I say, like, you know, the, the graft and everything else, if you can't be happy for me, then there's just, there's just no place for, um, for that because I'm such a girl code cheerleader. Like I love it when people do well, like I really want people to do well. Like Amber, who you interviewed, got something. I was like, oh my God, babe, it's you know, like I love that kind of connection and dynamic. And it, it really upsets me because there's all these posts about, oh, polish each other's crowns, queens, and, you know, look after each other. And, but yeah, it's women that are the first to bring each other down always and you're like what is this gap all about because we're, we're all posting these posts and being like yeah yeah you know raise each other up we're here for each other but then you know something goes out there and it's always a woman that tears you down first never a guy and I just find that so like collectively on a collective level really upsetting and that is why we start dimming our lights so this is a long answer to a boundaries question but actually I find it fairly easy to put the boundary in but it's as a result of probably being shown that that relationship has shifted to a place that maybe it's still going to be in my life but it's certainly not going to be in a place where I'm going to be say like sharing all of myself so the boundary bit itself I probably find fairly easy the heartbreak in the transition I'm human I find that quite hard you still have those people in your life but you limit access to you yeah it sounds terrible, but I demote them. Like, this sounds really bad, but they, they can get demoted. As in, like, I've only got so much energy. And I'm a single parent. I am running my business. I'm doing all this stuff. And, I, I you know, I want to show up in my relationships in a really quality way. Also, for me, I want to enjoy and be present for my interactions. So there is literally only so much I can possibly give. And if, if someone is kind of continually and consistently, and with me, they'd have to, it would be a very open-hearted. So it would be a lot. It would be an awful lot for me to kind of go, do you know what? This is really beginning to hurt me now. It's not even like I'm actually I'm actually like in a deficit. Like this is beginning to really hurt me. Then then that would be where I would kind of in my head sort of demote in, in the view of how much energy I'm putting into that person and that relationship right now. Doesn't mean it can't shift because sometimes people are going through stuff. And if they communicate that, of course, that's fine. I've asked a few times. I'm like, guys, I'm so sorry. I know I'm not really here for you right now. I'm really sorry I'm just working on this project or doing this thing and as soon as I can I'm going to be straight back in and like good friends are like no problem like that's great thank you and and being responsible and communicating it is really important. I also love what you said about you know you just want to see people in your inner circle who actually celebrate your success because it's so easy mm. when someone is down and you feel like yeah I can support this person me oh and my life is not as bad as theirs but when they actually have great news that's when people show their faces if oh, they yeah. support you or not and I completely agree with you on the point that unfortunately usually it's women who don't support other women because when I just thought about my examples I came up with two, and both of them are women, mm. which mm. is, uh, it's like, 
I don't know like what work did you do on the corporate side before, but I was in the financial services industry. So I worked uh, at JP Morgan, then different hedge funds, private equity. And I remember when I was in business school, I went to Wharton and usually you know, for the summer, you look for an internship, everybody want to do private equity. I'm like, well, it seems difficult. I should do it. So I reached out to a few people who graduated Wharton, but, you know, now they have successful careers in private equity. And I reached out to women because I thought they will be more helpful. And I remember, I should be careful here, (laughs) meeting one woman And, uh, you know, we were having a nice chat and then she looked at me, you know, I was just wanted to have an opportunity. I don't even need to be paid or like, just, I wanted to learn more about private equity. And she looked at me and said, you know, when I graduated, I had to work for a fund of like maybe a hundred million dollars two hours away from my home. And I did that commute every single day for two years. So why don't you do the same? Oh, wow. And then I was so pissed. I reached out to, careful again, someone from KKR, but very high up. And that person helped me without even knowing me. Yeah. I mean, that is like... Yeah, I mean, that's just the anti-girl code. And obviously, I'm I'm sure you know that's projection. But I mean, like, yeah, if you've got the opportunity to help someone, I really believe you always should. Like a five-minute favor is, as you're saying, all you were asking for was an opportunity. It wasn't, you know, maybe just an opportunity to have a a little bit of experience. I mean, kind of why bother meeting you if you weren't going to help as well? Like you're just wasting everyone's time. That's insane. So, yeah, I I think that there's... um, it's it's very sad, I think, when because we do experience, you know, collective pain as women and difficulties and challenges that we're overcoming and, you know, kind of and we're just we just are stronger in friendship. Like my really strong female friendships, like they have transcended everything with me. And I've got good male friends as well, but there's just something about being in a really open, um, you know, transparent friendship dynamics where people really do celebrate everything about you you know I I say it all the time but I am genuinely quite unhinged in my personal life I think because I because of the the sort of darkness I see you know I like to experience life to the full because I think I I've got that probably part of my personality but also I think because of what I see in life it it gives me I can feel huge sadness in the work that I'm doing but then I, I also have this desire therefore to kind of be out there and be experiencing everything do you think that when we start this self work everybody has some trauma yeah so yes i do and i think some of the language around it really needs to change because i think we don't feel deserving of having trauma now i work with a lot of veterans of the armed forces i think you mentioned that so but i think we think about trauma we think about ptsd and we think well i haven't been in the war i haven't been to afghanistan i haven't you know i don't deserve it i haven't we always know someone that's had it worse Right. A lot of people like to tell us they've had it worse. But we also know people that have been through huge grief or uh, other losses or accidents or things like that. And so and again, I think there's a little bit of good girling in there where we feel bad about taking up space with our, you know, because we feel like our trauma isn't the same as somebody else's. But you can have trauma that isn't even yours. You can take on trauma from something you witnessed. You can have trauma that lives with you from viewing something as a child that you just couldn't process because you were a child. And, you know, these things can live with you and they cause shame and shame makes you feel very isolated. You know, I trigger warning. I'm going to talk about sexual assault, but I have an awful lot of clients in here for sexual assault. And, you know, a lot of that is uh, someone they knew in some capacity. OK, so and that the shame that comes that the people are feeling which is not theirs to feel. And you and I could listen to stories and go, well, of course, that wasn't your fault. Of course, you didn't do that. Of course, you've always got autonomy over your body and everything like that. But there is there is this, this shame that often gets left behind from trauma. And that's the thing that isolates us and that we, we feel, you know, we've got to hide it and push it down even further. And that's the thing that affects our life and the vision of our life in the future. Our, you know, we talk about vision boards and action boards. I want all of these things, but oh, I can't do that because 
what if somebody finds out about that thing that happened to me? Or what if someone finds out that I'm this shameful creature? What if somebody finds out about that? And, you know, Brene Brown, obviously the high priestess of shame has talked all about this and she's amazing. But I think when you get to a certain point and you're able to express and share, even with like one person, one close friend or a therapist or whoever, or just in the self-reflection and you can get under the bonnet of that shame, it's so liberating but to anyone that's feeling shame it's usually related to some trauma and that is no no one gets to win trauma it's not the hunger games no one gets to win and it has the same impact on you as something you might see as a bigger event for somebody else so i think we need to kind of normalize the the experience that people are having needs to be for themselves they need to recognize that it's they are of value and their trauma is is having an effect on their on their value and the value of their life moving forwards and to sort of look into that for themselves so we have shame even though let's say something happened to us and we know that it was not our fault we still feel this way so if I give you an example about sexual assault, so there's five trauma responses. There's fight, flight, and freeze that most people know about. Then there's two more. There's flop, which is pass out. And then there's fawn. Now, fawn is most present in situations of assault and abuse, domestic violence, relationships, things like that. But also like narcissism at work. There's trauma at work people aren't talking about. But let's stick with sexual assault for now. So let's just say, and I'm going to be very careful as well because I've quite a lot this week. So uh, I'm going to try and make sure I don't, don't sort of say anything um you've got somebody that uh has been out for a drink with with someone or or they're known to you like for a friendship group and maybe you shared a kiss with them or something and and that was it that was as far as you wanted to go and then the situation becomes an uh aggressive dangerous situation now the trauma responses live in the animal part of your brain the limbic system and that fires so much faster than your prefrontal cortex which is at the front of your brain and your broker's area which is language the second you sense discomfort danger your prefrontal cortex has gone offline now that's like thought decision making all of that is gone, timelines, dates, and your language possibly goes. So we know when people say, I can't remember what he said, but I remember exactly what he was wearing. Or I can't remember what he said, but I know the song that was playing in the car at the time. Like all those, I remember the trousers I was wearing, right? But I cannot remember what, what he said. Um, that's what's happening. Anyway, the fawn trauma response will be pre-selected for you. You do not choose it. This is the most important thing for me to say about this and shame. Because it's the most applicable thing to do to keep you alive in that situation so let's just use the example of male female sexual assault let's just say the male is physically bigger and stronger and you're in a situation that you can't escape so flight won't work you can't run you can't fight this person off if you freeze that's not going to go particularly well for you if you flop it could be really bad for you so the only one left is fawn now fawning you might act like you are in inverted commas up for it or like you might encourage it. I've heard one of the worst, un unimaginable, frankly, cases of premeditated sexual assault that ended up going to court. And at one point during a two and a half hour long sustained attack, uh, this person said that took took off sort of more of their clothes and just went, just get on with it then, just get on with it. And just said, I thought I was going to die. I literally thought I was going to die. And so I just said, just get on with it. Now, this, as I say, has been to court, been to the police, been everything. And they had so much shame about that moment, thinking that in some way it was their fault. I mean, I see your reaction to it. Like, in some way it was their fault. In some way they'd done something to, something wrong, something to encourage it. That why would I do that when there's this perpetrator and this aggressor? That is why. And I think as women, most of us, sadly, have had an experience at some point in our lives that we have formed. Now, whether that's, as I say, like a narcissistic boss whether it's a, a mean girl situation, whether it's, uh, you know, this is, a, I'm giving an extreme end of the scale, but I think most of us maybe have been, had our, have been touched in a way that we didn't ask for and been really scared. I certainly have. And then and you're like, why, why didn't I, you come away, you're like, why didn't I slap him in the face? Why didn't I scream at him? Why didn't I um, raise the alarm? You think, well, maybe I must have encouraged it. I must have looked at him in a certain way. I must, have, no, no, you were fawning. And that's a trauma response. And um, we need to have a lot more language around that and understand that better because there's all these 
people walking around with years and often decades of shame which makes you feel like you did something wrong in that moment or you or again you can't understand it you knew you were frightened but why did I act that way then that tells me I can't trust myself well I can't trust myself because I did this why would I do that maybe I am that kind of a person you know it gives you it fills your head with all these thoughts and what that does is it can encourage you to isolate yourself and retract from certain kinds of relationships or social interactions or things like that so this is a really really important piece of information that I don't think is widely discussed or understood or recognized and yeah it's that shame that's keeping us isolated because we think we're the only ones is it also the way our brain protect us because sometimes when we experience this trauma like big trauma right big t trauma i think it's called yeah but then we forget about it and then 30 40 years later regular day and there is some trigger and you remember yeah so the prefrontal cortex i mentioned goes offline and so there's a broker's area so the blood is being rerouted however even though it's not sort of active in the moment, it's tagging. So it's tagging things like, you know, like when you smell an ex's aftershave and you're like, oh, that was, you know, whoever, James, like you're taken back to that moment straight away. So if you're in a situation when it could be any environment, there could be certain smells. I had somebody in today and there were certain cleaning products and then they get re-triggered in another environment where the cleaning product is the same. And But you don't know about that at the time. Your brain's tagging things that might be useful later because right now we need to stay alive. So right now my blood is, you know, getting me out of this. I mean, my trauma response because I just need to stay alive. But the brain is tag, 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 tagging. So exactly as you say, you could find yourself in um, a car, a situation, a room that has a hotel room that has a similar setup, anything that you haven't cognitively thought about and you might not be cognitively thinking about it, but your whole brain, your system's gone, <gasps> and you're completely re-triggered. I also unfortunately hear so many stories like this recently, and it's exactly like everything was fine, and then suddenly I remember this, and now yeah. I have shame. Yeah. It was my fault. I don't know who I am. I don't know what to do. I'm not worthy enough. There is like nothing left for me. Nobody talks about it. I would encourage anyone that is having those sorts of thoughts to, as uncomfortable as this might feel, to place your best friend or one of your best friends in that situation and like run it through in your head. And was it their fault? Did they ask for it in inverted commas? Did they, did they lead that person on? And when you watch, you know, the sort of memory again with someone else in that seat, especially if it happened younger, maybe like a niece or, you know, a, a friend's kid. It's a horrible thing to do. But when you watch, when it's yourself, we feel shame. We find it really hard to give compassion. So the only cure for shame is self-compassion. And I'm trying to give a tool here for someone that's listening to this. Um, I appreciate to work with me as privilege and, you know, all the rest of it. Um, but I am coming to New York at the end of February if someone would like to have one-to-one -one sessions. I do this literally. I do this every most days and work people through uh, this trauma. So... But a way to cultivate self-compassion, one of the ways to do it, a different perspective, is to place someone that you love really dearly into that scenario. And then honestly, was it their fault? Were they asking for it? And of course, no. And that's one way of being able to sort of put the shine the lens of self-compassion on you. This is such a powerful advice because as you were just saying this, I thought for myself, okay, if my friend would tell me this horrible story about, you know, sexual assault. And my reaction would be, what else were you supposed to do? Like, you knew you cannot run away. So for you, if you start fighting, obviously he is stronger than you are. Maybe he will kill you or mm -hmm. it will be more damaged. So it was the only safe way to approach it in that situation in that moment um wow thank you for this advice i i'm sure it will help so many people because it's definitely so. not I easy so. to go through such an experience not at all and i think it just isn't discussed enough and i think the more that people understood they never you cannot choose your trauma responses and I think when, because people carry shame for like, why did I do that? You were, you were in trauma in that moment. And 
I think the more and more people understand that it was an automated response to keep you alive, you did not choose it, that is helping to liberate them from some shame they might be feeling. If you look back at your life through all their like self-discovery and healing work that you do on yourself, you help your clients, what is one thing you would never do again? Ooh, I love that question. What I never do again. I would never think that I was bad for years and years because I grew up in a household of domestic violence and I believed that I must be really bad. That was like the lens, like the shit tinted spectacles. I thought I was bad. I thought I was a bad girl and like just bad and horrible and hard to love. So never again would I believe that or say that to myself. <laughs> 